what if there was construction technology that was fireproof, soundproof, bugproof, bulletproof, breathable, moldproof, non-toxic, regulated humidity without fans, wires, or switches, regulated temperature, it was very low cost to run your building, ultra low maintenance, structurally sound, earthquake resistant if built well, hurricane and tornado resistant, ultra low embodied energy, thousand year durability, recyclable, locally available, and it's available worldwide. Would you be interested in a building product like that? This is it, right here. It's compressed earth block. We've got a bunch of them up here. Uh, you can come up and grab them and poke them uh, afterwards. We make uh, several different sizes, 6 by 12, 7 by 14s, 10 by 14s. Uh, sustainability is a key word for all of us, I think, in this room, one that's been used a lot lately. This particular definition was created by the United Nations Brentland Report in 1987, and I think it's a pretty good one. It's pretty succinct. It uh, states the case pretty clearly. Sustainable development is that which meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Pretty good, but not really good enough. Here's kind of the steps that we've gone through for those of us in the green building movement. We had business as usual. Uh, we all, I think, know what that is, and it's, it's destroying the planet, basically. And so we, we realized we have to do something about it. So we decided we would become green. That was the hot buzzword to start. Uh, we're going to be green. Well, that word has been co-opted by so many products that aren't. You know, we have styrofoam blocks filled with cement and concrete and steel, you know, and that's a green block. Well, it's not a green block. You know, that's an incredibly high embodied energy product. So it's been co-opted by so many uh, non-environmental uh, materials that we've abandoned it completely in, in our world. And then we went to sustainable, uh, the definition we just saw, which is admirable. You know, we should try to not damage the planet. But we've damaged it so badly already that, again, that's not good enough. So we have to go to the next step, which is restorative. We need to start putting it back. But that's not even good enough because we've done so much damage already that we don't have enough time to put it back. So we need to go to the final step, which is regenerative. We need to develop a way to live so that we're enhancing the relationship with the earth. And what we plant or what we build will be there in an environmental friendly way and regenerating the planet. That's our goal. People have been building out of earth for millennia, which probably most of you know. This is the Pueblos in Taos, New Mexico. They hold the title of the oldest continually occupied buildings in North America. The Native Americans have been living in those for a thousand years, still do. And, uh, you know, the bugs don't eat them and they don't burn, so they, they stick around. Uh, we have here Shabam in Yemen. It's referred to as the Manhattan of the desert, and you can see why. Those are all adobe buildings between 5 and 11 stories tall and using some techniques of passive cooling and that they're built in such a way that they shade uh, each other, which is important out there in the desert. This is the Jene Mosque in Mali, West Africa, and it's the largest adobe building by mass in the world today. It's hand-packed mud blocks and mud plaster. The locals have a party every year and replaster. Those three buildings that you just saw are made out of adobe, and this is how you make adobe. Most of you know, you make forms, you mix your clay and your straw, sand, and you pack it in there. You let it set up enough that you can take the form off, you stand the block up, let it dry in the sun for a few weeks, and then you build with it. And people have been doing it for thousands and thousands of years, and it's very effective, and I love adobe. I'm not here to uh, discard adobe in any way. The problems with adobe uh, are two. One, it's very slow, as you can see by the, the technique here. Uh, to make the blocks. And the other is that it's pretty much a regional product. People think of adobes as Pueblo-style buildings in New Mexico or West Texas or whatever because that's the only place they could do it, because it's the only place where it didn't rain for long periods of time and they had hot sun and they could bake the blocks and then, and then build with them. So that's why it was, it was uh, confined pretty much to warm belts. Now we have hydraulic machinery. And with this machinery, we can We've expanded the geographical area that you can do earth blocks. We can do it. We've done it in Montana. We've done it in Colorado. We can do it in the snow. 
we can do it anywhere, actually. So now uh, these machine-made adobes can create the same ambiance and healthful environment that regular adobes did, but anywhere in the world. Other advantages of this system are that the compressive strength of an adobe block by the New Mexico Code is a minimum of 300. We average around 1,500. We just had one tested in Fredericksburg that was 2,500. Um, so they're much stronger. Another advantage is that they're absolutely dimensional. They're flat on the top and the bottom. They're all the same thickness as you can see them down here. We can make them different thicknesses, but we can maintain that thickness. Therefore, we're using about 70% less mortar than an adobe wall, where you have thick mortar joints. They're about 20% mortar in the wall. We're using a quarter of an inch because we don't have to worry about leveling our courses because our blocks are even. So the strength, the speed of manufacturing, the speed of laying them up, and the geographical expansion of earthen walls uh, is one of the big advantages of our system. These are several different blocks by different machine manufacturers. The three on the left are from Advanced Earthen Construction Technologies, AECT, machines made in San Antonio, Texas. Several of these blocks up here are AECT. I have two of their machines, a small one and a big one. The next one with the larger holes is made by Ital Mexicana, a very wonderful machine manufacturer in Mexico City. The three smaller blocks on the right are from the Orem Press, which is a manual uh, press from, from the Oroville Institute in India. What does an earthen wall do for you? This particular chart was created by Hassan Fathi, a fairly famous Egyptian architect, famous at least in our world. Uh, who took, brought earthen construction to Egypt. This graph was then picked up by Gernot Menke, a German professor engineer who also preaches the dirt gospel, and put it in his book, and I grabbed it from there. What we have here is an earthen building and a concrete building. The yellow band across the middle is the human comfort zone. That's where you're not too hot, not too cold. The black band, which is the same on both graphs, is the outside ambient temperature over the same 24-hour period in these two buildings. And the red line is the interior temperature in those two buildings. Here we have the red line in the earthen building, and there you have the red line in the concrete building. So we can see some of the advantages of having a breathable wall that will help you control your interior temperature and humidity without fans, wires, or switches. The next three slides are about energy consumption and gas emissions in the United States. We think of factories, we think of traffic jams, uh, we think of the things we're doing to the planet with all of this. But these, these three pie charts are indicative of something very important. And you'll see it on this first one, uh, industry at 24%, transportation at 28%, and then buildings at 47.5%. This is the energy consumed in the United States. So if we're going to get after the energy crisis, we need to get after the architects, the engineers, the builders, and we need to educate the public about what's happening with energy. Here's electricity to operate uh, in the United States, consumption by sector. You see industry at 25. Uh, you can see that the electric car got buried, so transportation isn't too much. And then you see buildings. So again, we need to get after the the building industry if we're going to get after the energy crisis. Here's the final slide in this triumvirate of emissions of greenhouse gases. Again, transportation, those traffic jams are pretty bad. Industry does its share, but buildings are the biggest culprit in the emission of greenhouse gases. So it's about construction with uh, natural, breathable, non-toxic materials is where we need to go. The next few buildings you'll see are Buildings in Colorado and New Mexico, upon which I served as a general contractor. This first one is a Pueblo style, which is what people think of when they think of adobe or compressed earth blocks. They think of the southwest. They think of parapet walls, flat roofs, vigas, and what have you. This is an example of that, and it's a, it's a good one. But we're not limited to that. It, it can be any style you want. Uh, here's a small castle, for instance, out of earth blocks. This, uh, you don't see too many... Uh, turrets with uh, witches' caps on them in, in uh, Santa Fe. This is a little different. And here we have an octagon. Okay, this is also out of earth blocks. So the, the style is, is unlimited 
uh, by this product. It's a wall system, and we can build anything you want. I will give a little comment on octagons. Uh, round is a lot easier. So if you're going to do something like this, we would prefer to do round than an octagon. We, if anybody wants to know why, we can talk about it afterwards. Here's another. This was Earthlock 1. This was my house in Colorado for 18 years. Real simple. Big box with a gable roof. And the heating and cooling system in this house, remember this is in Colorado, so we're not fighting quite as much heat as we are here in Texas. But in the summertime, we get up in the 90s, and my heating and cooling system for this house in the summertime was to go over to these four transom windows right here in the living room at night and open them and then close them in the morning. And that was the entire, my entire effort in heating and cooling the house and it stayed right at 68 degrees all the time because I had massive thermal walls that were working for me. These are interiors of those same buildings. Again, we like breathable walls. This is of, of all those lists of things you saw about the advantages of earth locks when we started this, uh, breathable is one of the most important. So we want to preserve that, that benefit by using natural plasters inside and out. We use clay inside and lime outside. These are some examples of those plasters. They're beautiful. Uh, the treehouse here handles American clay, which is a wonderful product. We've used it in several buildings. In 2003, I got called to Baja California Sur for a big development down there. They decided to do it out of earth blocks, and we made about 2 million lime-stabilized earth blocks in Baja, and they built quite a bit of the development with our lime-stabilized blocks and with lime plaster, and this is one of, one of those buildings. The Rhode Island School of Design, RISD, goes to San Miguel de Allende, Mexico, every year and contributes their architectural talents and designs a building for low-income uh, sections of San Miguel. This doesn't look like a low-income building, I realize, but this is a, a community building in the poorest neighborhood in San Miguel. They chose to use our earth blocks. We also do small buildings. In fact, we prefer small buildings. This particular small building was built at Rancho La Puerta in Tecate, Mexico, uh, this last summer over the course of two workshops. The owners of Rancho La Puerta are contemplating a 200-unit eco-village, and they wanted to find a, an ecological building system. So there we were building this first house for an intern, and then we hope that they will move forward and do their eco-village out of earth blocks. This is the smallest house I ever built. This is in a backyard in San Antonio, Texas. It's 200 square feet. And due to the earth block barrel vault roof, there's a loft up there. So you can sleep upstairs. You've got a living room and a little bathroom and a little kitchen downstairs. And this, this house can uh, very comfortably house a person or two people, no doubt about it. 200 square feet. So it can be done. Levittown, New York. This is where it started as far as the change that our country went through to stick building and suburbia. Bill Levitt was in the Navy in World War II. His job was to build efficient housing for the troops quickly, mobile. He became very good at it. He came home to New York after the war. His family was in the construction business. He said there's hundreds of thousands of GIs coming home. They want to buy houses. Uh, they're going to get GI loans. Uh, what are we going to do? How and their guiding light to answer this crisis was, how fast can we build them, and how cheap can we build them? And that's what they did, and they were extremely successful. And what you saw is Levittown. And that suburban sprawl idea caught on like wildfire, spread all over the country. I understand it. There was a housing shortage, there was a burning need, and so they did this. Unfortunately for us, it stuck. And now we're still building these kind of buildings with little skinny hollow walls filled with pink insulation and sealed up so they cannot breathe. That's a big deal. We want to put sheetrock and paint on the inside and then on the outside, let's, let's wrap it in some sort of barrier and put vinyl siding on it and we built a thermos bottle. The problem with building a thermos bottle is that all the air that's inside that thermos bottle needs to be conditioned somehow. 
air conditioned or heated or circulated uh, in some way. If you have an earthen wall, that's not that way. Here's the earthen wall. You have a thick thermal mass, breathable. And by breathable, we mean able to absorb and release water vapor. This isn't water. This is water vapor. Water vapor molecules are the same size as air. We want that to go in and out because it controls heat and humidity for us. So our buildings are not thermos bottles. They absorb and release water vapor. And you can either have exposed earth blocks. If you see here, we typically plaster the inside with a base coat of clay, sand, straw, and cactus juice. We put on an interior clay finish. Uh, again, the American Clay product's just great, but you can also make your own. On the exterior, it's the same base coat. We use the same base coat. And then we use lime or lime and clay for the finished product. And we're breathable. That way we haven't destroyed that benefit of the wall. If you, if you slap cement stucco on the side of it, you, know, you haven't ruined the building, but you just took away one of the key benefits of that. Here's some examples. This was in Takathi at the workshop. You can see the three different plasters here. This is the base coat of clay, sand, straw, a little bit of lime, and cactus juice. And it's the same base coat inside and out. This is clay and sand. This is on the inside as a finished coat. And this is lime and sand and cactus juice, the exterior lime plaster. Uh, why cactus juice? And you see some ingredients over here, uh, the chopped straw, which is the fiber in the base coat to retard or prevent cracking. You can use the fibers that you buy for cement as well. But the straw is actually better because we're trying to slow the cure. Any masonry product is better the slower it cures. When the guy pours your driveway, he should be out there wetting it down for three weeks to make it better, but they don't. Um, but we're trying to dry slowly. So the straw in the base coat holds moisture and, and retards the drying. The lime plaster on the outside, you need to keep misting it. You need to keep it shaded and let it cure slowly so that it works well. The cactus juice is, does three things for you, basically. It's real slimy, uh, snotty. Uh, you mix that with uh, your plaster. And uh, first of all, it makes it easier to trowel on because it's slicker. And second of all, it's gooey and sticky, so it's kind of a binder for you between your sand and clay and lime particles. But the most important is the third feature, which is we're trying to dry slowly. And if you mix your plaster with water, water evaporates pretty quickly. If you mix your plaster with cactus juice, it doesn't evaporate very quickly. It, it retards the drying. So it's, that's the main reason we, we put that in. It's been used, again, like our whole system. That cactus juice has been used for a millennia. Lime plaster repels rain and snow. No doubt about it. Just because it's breathable doesn't mean it leaks. It's just like your skin. You know, you're absorbing water vapor and air through your skin and out of your skin all day, every day, but you don't leak. When you go out in the rain, you don't fill up with water. Well, that's the same thing with our plasters. This is an example. Uh, this is in Lusaka, Zambia. We did a test house there of white lime plaster on the exterior. Now, pure white isn't everybody's favorite, but it's your first step against uh, heat. It's just passive cooling at its finest. Uh, you have white uh, as a reflective source. White lime plaster will reflect significantly more heat and light than white paint because it's a whole bunch of little particles of sand and lime and what have you, and so it's a refractory. It's like a prism. It bounces that heat and light off the building. So it's a, a good thing to do. You can color it. It's better to do pastels than something dark, especially here in Texas. It's hot, so we're trying to stay light and stay cool. This is the Mission San Javier in Baja, California. When I first got to Loreto, they were starting to remodel this mission. And they heard that there was some guy down at Loreto Bay that knew something about lime. So they brought me um, a chunk, because they were remodeling. They brought me a chunk of the plaster off of the old mission. And they said, can you tell us what this is? And I said, well, no, I can't really. Uh, I'm not a chemist. But I will smuggle it back to the United States for you and take it to a chem lab and have them crush it up and tell me what's in it. And I'll tell you, let you know. So the chem lab wrote on the back of this remaining piece, uh, BCS Mexico, circa 1697, 1697, 
It's pretty old. 40% lime and 60% sand. That's what this is. Nothing else. So does lime plaster work? Indeed it does. Breathable walls. I keep pounding about breathable and I can't help it. It's, uh, it's real important. We're absorbing and releasing water vapor. This is a cooling device for you. But here's how it works. Your wall is a battery. Okay, we've got a little battery drawn here. There's not really a battery in the wall, but that's what it is. It's absorbing the heat that you generate from inside the building. This particular slide is for a cold winter day in Montana. All right, so you've got to generate heat inside somehow. You're doing it with a wood stove. You're doing it with a rocket mass heater. You're doing it with passive solar design with the sun coming through the glass. Perhaps you've got radiant and floor heating. God forbid you've got a forced air system. But whatever you've got, you're generating heat inside the building. If you're in a thermos bottle, what you're heating is the air inside the building. That's all you're heating. If you're in an earthen building, you're also heating the walls. So that when you open the door and the warm air rushes out, and in your thermos bottle, the thermostat freaks out, fires up, burns some fuel, kicks you back up to whatever temperature you want it to be, and in an earthen building, the wall it's colder in there than I am, and they let some of that stored heat out. Your battery works for you. It lets it out. This is not to say you won't need heating system in Montana in an earth block building. You do. It's just going to mitigate and minimize the amount of energy you need to maintain that comfort zone, as we saw in the earlier slide. Here's warm in the winter. This happens at night. This is that same, same building in Montana. You've heated up the walls, and it's real cold at night, but... Again, you've got some heat coming out of the walls that you store during the day, and you're going to use less heat to maintain your comfort zone. Cool in the summer. And this has been a standard line about Adobe forever. It's warm in the winter, cool in the summer. And it is. And it is all by itself without a lot of other help. So here we are in the summer. You have a cool summer night. So you want to cool the inside of your building like I said I did with my building in Colorado. I open the windows at night. Let the cool air in, shut them in the morning, building stay cool all day. So you can open the window at night. You can run your air conditioner, but again, you're going to run it significantly less than you are in any other type of building. So here's, here's a hot summer day. Now it's morning, okay, and the sun has come up and the day is heating up. The walls have absorbed this humidity at night because they're breathable, and when the sun hits them, it evaporates that moisture. It's an evaporative cooler. Your wall becomes an evaporative cooler. This was proven by John Maroney, who you see on the upper right here, a scientist who lives in Del Rio, Texas, who built four little test modules. He's now joined them all together, and they're his house. But originally, they were four little buildings. Three were earth blocks, one lime stabilized, one cement stabilized, one unstabilized. The fourth building was concrete. They were all exactly the same size. He, ran, he put data loggers in them for a year, and, of course, the concrete house just fried. This is Del Rio. It's 115, and it, it was off the scale. I mean, it was unfit for human habitation. The three earth block buildings, he was surprised to find very little difference, no measurable difference in the heating and cooling in those three buildings. But what shocked him, and he didn't expect, was that the coolest moment in the 24-hour cycle, in the three earthen buildings, was at 4.30 in the afternoon. So the sun had been pounding on the house all day, and it was getting cooler and cooler and cooler. And that's because it was evaporating the humidity that had been absorbed in the walls, and it got cooler all day long. This is a 5% lime-stabilized earth block from Loreto, Baja California sewer, that was underwater for one year. So we took it out after a year and demonstrated that it's, it's absolutely structurally sound. It was completely saturated and filled with water, but it maintained its structural integrity because the lime combined with the clay and stabilized the block. This is in Baja California, sir, also. Jeff, my partner, and I were in Mexico City when Hurricane John hit the peninsula, 90-mile-an-hour winds, um, 30 inches of rain over the course of three days. There were several buildings that were in the status that you see right here. The reinforcement system in Loreto, it's a high seismic zone. The reinforcement system was concrete castillos, concrete bond beams. There was rebar in those channels. And then after we 
built the blocks, they poured all the concrete. Well, there were several buildings in this situation when the hurricane hit where the concrete had not been poured. Like I said, 90 mile an hour winds, 30 inches of rain for three days. Jeff and I are going, I wonder how it's going, you know. We got back, and this picture was taken three days. This is the hurricane in action, but this picture was taken three days after the hurricane. These freestanding panels of earth locks said, is that the best you can do? And they just stood there. The, there were several interior cinder block walls, CMUs, that were in the same situation. They hadn't poured the concrete yet, and, of course, they blew over. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, it's a heavy wall, which is a good thing. It's a very good thing. They're fireproof, absolutely. You can't burn dirt. This picture on the left is a client that we had in Colorado many years ago that made a video for us, and this was taken from the video, holding a roofing torch to the wall for 20 minutes, and, of course, it just turned the wall black. Nothing happened. Uh, the right hand is uh, my, my crew right here uh, in January. Was, it was very cold in the house we were building in Fredericksburg, so they made their own little thermal mass heater here in the corner and burn scrap wood in that so they'd have one warm corner to go to at lunchtime. In San Antonio, there was a project that was built, and because we were inside the city limits, uh, they wanted to really prove that dirt doesn't burn. Okay, so this is a block from a wall that was built in the testing lab in San Antonio, and they put it to however many thousands of degrees of fire necessary. And you can see what it did is it fired the surface of the block for about a quarter of an inch. So it got a lot harder. It was like a fire brick, but uh, obviously nothing happened anywhere else. So that's the fire block. On my way to visit one of my first customers in Texas, who's seated here in the front row, I, uh, I was on my way to her house, and I took a picture that you can see here of how it looked in Bastrop. Uh, what you see in the background is the remnants of a house that did not survive that fire. The remnants, of course, are the masonry section. I got to Judy's, and I started this whole spiel about earth blocks, and I was about five minutes into it. She said, Jim, do they burn? I said, no, they don't burn. And she said, that's what I want. So there's Judy's house in Bastrop. You can ask Judy about it after class. They're bulletproof. This is true. This is, uh, again, the customers in Colorado were NRA instructors, so they had quite an arsenal of uh, firepower. We built a small test wall for them, and they fired all the pistols they had from 38s up to 357 Magnums. All those pistol bullets hit the wall, flattened out, fell off. The 3030 rifle that Bonnie is firing right there uh, went in the wall about three inches. So they are, in fact, bulletproof. Bulletproof is, is, is one thing, you know, but when you test for hurricane resistance at Texas Tech, they have testing equipments, and the way they do it is they, they have a gun that fires a 2x4 at 150 miles an hour at the subject wall to see what would happen. Well, of course, you do that to an earth block wall, and it bounces off. It's laughable. So we had our engineer calculate what the difference was between 150 mile an hour 2x4 and a 30-30 bullet, and it's, uh, it's significantly different, uh, but these didn't go through either. So hurricane-proof, tornado-proof, it's the three little pigs. And you can't blow this down. You cannot blow this down. That's a fact. Seismic reinforcement. I build in a lot of seismic zones. This isn't one of them, but I have, and it's real important. Uh, I've built in Haiti, and I've built in Mexico, and... It's important to pay attention to what sort of reinforcement you need in a seismic zone. This particular shake table that you're seeing here is in Lima, Peru, at the Universidad Católica. They are very concerned with seismic reinforcement of earthen buildings because Peru shakes all the time, and a lot of people live in adobe buildings. So they've done a lot of research on what's, the, what's a reinforcement system that's going to be affordable but will work. This first building is unreinforced. So this is an example of what happens uh, to the people that live in these unreinforced adobes. You can see, I think this was a Richter 7 test. I, I don't, I'm not positive about that. But. 
This, this is the kind of thing that gives Adobe a bad name right there. <laughs> Doesn't look too good. The second uh, building that you're going to see <clears throat> is exactly the same design, but they've reinforced it with what we call the basket. The, the second building has no rebar in it. It simply has mesh on the inside and the outside. And then at Berkeley, they perfected it by actually through tying those, those two wires together. Hence, that's why we call it the basket. So that's this building. You can kind of see the mesh wrapped around there. And you can see what happens with the same, the same test. This is the one you want to be in. They did a similar test in Berkeley. I know the engineer that was at, at that test. And they did a building that they, they used the same building all the way through. They started unreinforced and shook it a little bit until it would crack, and then they would patch it. And it was too expensive to do them over and over. So they did that. Then they put a roof diaphragm on it. They shook it a little bit till it cracked, and they patched it, and they did it over. And then this poor building had been through like eight earthquakes before they got to the final one, which was the basket. And they had through-tied the thing, put it together. They called the press and the TV stations and said, come on over, we're going to knock it down today. And they couldn't knock it down. I've seen uh, videos of that. And it's a little different than this one. This one actually shaking it. In Berkeley, it's a ground acceleration deal where they would run the table and just stop it. Wham! Like that. And the building would do this. And then it would kind of pop back up. And they did it over and over and over. And they couldn't knock it over. So this is pretty good testimonial to a good form of reinforcement. At the University of Oklahoma in Norman, we've had the good fortune uh, thanks to the fellow in the cowboy hat and the red shirt there, uh, Dr. Charles Graham is the dean of architecture at OU, used to be the dean at A&M, and he's a big Earthblock fan. They have a machine at A&M, and now they have a machine at OU. And they combined, the Department of Architecture combined with Habitat for Humanity to build two houses side by side, as you see here, exactly the same footprint, same block, one out of kindling, I'm sorry, out of sticks, and one out of uh, earth blocks. And they, these are finished now, and the people have moved in, and the university's got data loggers in there, so we're real excited to see how they do. It's a wonderful project, and we're anxious to get the results. Different kinds of machines. There are a multitude of machines around the world. People have been mashing dirt into blocks for a long time. I'm very familiar with three or four of them, and those are the ones you're going to see here. This is the Orem Press, which is manufactured at the Oroville Institute in India. The fellow you see on the right there is Satra Maini. He's the director of the Oroville Institute. He's actually a French engineer, but he went directly from Crater in France to Oroville in 1989. He's been running it ever since. He's an amazing guy, just a wealth of knowledge. I would recommend that you go to their website, earth oroville uh, for the most comprehensive website I've ever seen on earth blocks. It's just amazing uh, what he's done. And he designed this machine. I have one of these machines in Texas. We used one in Haiti, and we've got one in Mexico. It's a wonderful machine. It's hard. It's manual. It takes two guys with a lot of effort to make blocks. But Sapram gets 1,000 blocks a day in India. So... And, and it's, it's unbelievably durable. Uh, you could drop it off a three-story building and nothing would happen. If you buy all the chambers he's got for it, you can make 75 different blocks. It's an amazing machine. This is the Ital Mexicana from Mexico City. This is the machine we're currently using in Haiti. The, the fellow you see standing over here is Francesco Piazzesi. He's one of the owners of Ital Mexicana, but he's also the founder and driving force of this organization called Echela Atucasa. Echela Atucasa has built an excess of 30,000 earth block houses in Mexico for people who need them through an incredible self-help program. Uh, got the government involved, got the banks involved, got the people involved. He's an amazing man. Echela was nominated for the World Habitat Awards last year, made the finals, uh, didn't win, should have. Uh, amazing, amazing guy and a good machine. 
This is an AECT machine made right here in San Antonio, Texas. This is mine. It's, this picture's in Mexico, but that machine is now in Fredericksburg. And there's Lawrence Jetter, the uh, driving force of AECT, a wonderful, wonderful man who's been making block machines for about 25 years in San Antonio. And he makes that was the small model. This is the big model. This picture was taken in Colorado. This is three of Lawrence's AECT 3500s underneath the uh, covers over there. This was in Baja California Sur, where we were able to make 9,000 blocks a day, and we did make about 2 million blocks uh, during the time I was there. It was quite the, quite the deal. They were all lime stabilized. I think it was the first time that anybody had ever mass produced uh, lime, lime stabilized blocks for a, a large development. These are the buildings that were built with those blocks in Loreto. Those are lime stabilized blocks and lime plaster. And then we go back to the, the founder of our industry, if you will, the Sinva Ram, which was invented in Bogota, Colombia in 1956. It's basically the first compressed earth block machine of the modern era. And the first major project with earth blocks was also in Colombia, a community called Gaviotas, which is out on the eastern uh, plains of Colombia. If you don't know about it, you should look it up because Paolo Lugari, uh, a genius from Bogota, and his group of scientists decided that we needed to be able to build and live in places that were described as uninhabitable. So they went out to the Llanos in eastern Colombia, nothing out there but a desert, a few jackrabbits and snakes, and they said, here it is. We're going to build a community right here and show the world how you can live. And what they did to make it livable was they planted 25,000 hectares of trees. And now they live in a rainforest. And they grow all their own food, and they invent windmills and pumps, and uh, it's an amazing place. The, the title of the book, if you get it, is Gaviotas, A Village to Reinvent the World. Nobody's ever heard about it. They don't publicize themselves, but they have done this amazing, amazing work. And I followed Paolo Ligari around for three days, just like a little kid writing down quotes. I never went to university because I didn't want to stop my thinking, you know, stuff like that. And, uh, but when he would talk about problems, he would talk about air problems, he would talk about water problems, he would talk about soil problems, he'd talk about food problems, talk about people problems, he'd go through all these things. His solution was the same every time, every time. Plant trees. It fixes everything. It fixes the air, it fixes the water, it fixes the soil, it makes it so you can grow things, you plant trees. So, what's the other, the flip side of that is, don't cut them, <laughs> you know, we're, we're a little short at this point. You know, they're uh, clear-cutting in the Amazon. This is the triple bottom line. We've all heard about economic, social, environmental sustainability. If you're not doing all three, you're not doing it. Well, this is a way to do it. There's air, there's water, there's food, there's shelter. We're in a, a little niche in this. We've got some dirt blocks, and we're doing better houses. We're not going to save the world with this, but we're trying to do our part. But this is... This is an example of how it can be done. This particular home for a mother and her 11 children in San Miguel de Ande was replaced with this. There's a wonderful organization there called Casita Linda that builds a house a month and gives them to needy, needy people, and that's her home now. This is in Dolores Hidalgo, just uh, west of San Miguel. Sedesa is an organization that's worked with the Campesino communities in the state of Guanajuato since 1950s. They do wonderful things about water and food and everything, but they were still building out of fired bricks. Well, we don't like fired bricks because that's fire, that's fuel, so we don't use any. This house, we were able to be given the permission to build a house on their campus in, in Dolores Hidalgo. And this one has, has it all, really. It has earth block walls, earth block roofs, rainwater catchment, composting toilet, gray water recycling, ta-da, yeah, solar power, you know, the works. And it's, it's the direction where we're trying to go and will continue to go. This was a house for the Crow in Montana, uh, sponsored by the BIA. The funding went through the University of Colorado, so they sent me up there to help them make blocks. And I didn't, I went up, helped them make blocks, didn't hear anything more about it for a couple of years, ran into Bernard Amaday from the University of Colorado, 
at an Engineers Without Borders conference a few years later. I said, Bernard, what happened? Did they build the houses? What, what happened? You know, and he said, well, you know, they're complaining. The crow are complaining. I went, what's the matter? And he said, well, we got a call last January, and the, uh, the inhabitant of this house said, it's too warm in here. This is January in Montana. And the engineer said, open the window. <laughs> so they were, they were pretty well designed. This is in San Antonio, Texas. It has, um, I was engaged in making the blocks for this project. And that's where this fire test block came from. And it had significance because it was the first project of this size out of earth blocks inside the city limits of a major U.S. city. So we, we broke some ground there by getting uh, into San Antonio with compressed earth blocks. We use story poles, angle iron, put it up on the corners, pull a string. As long as those story poles are plumb and square to the building, uh, our forming system is two line blocks and a string, which you can see here. We slide it up and down the story poles. The mason set the blocks to the string. The wall is perfectly plumb perfectly straight, the building is perfectly square. It's a real simple system, and it works real well, as long as the masons follow the string. And here we have one of our masons setting the block to the string. There he is. And that's how it works. You can see the story pole. This is on the house in Fredericksburg right now. Uh, bomb beams are a critical part of any masonry structure. We use them, of course. You can use wood. You see a uh, graphic of that system here. I prefer to use concrete because I don't like to put temporary products in my permanent buildings. So we use steel reinforced concrete for the bond beam. And on the uh, lower side there, you'll see them pouring the bond beam in Chiapas. And then we, over here, that's me guiding some uh, concrete into the bond beam on the building in Fredericksburg by virtue of this wonderful tool, the concrete pumper truck. We like earthen roofs too. This is a, a low cambered earth block barrel vault roof on my 30 meter house in Mexico. And this is Bernard Amade, the founder of Engineers Without Borders at one of our workshops doing his first squinch for an earth block vault. This vault that you see are also earth blocks and those are the little cunhas, the brick size that are made with the Orem press. Again, the triple bottom line, local people, local material, and moving it around. This is in Chiapas. You can see them with, working with their arm press there. Here we have the arm press in, in the, on the upper side in Zambia, on the lower side in Haiti. Here's Oaxaca, Mexico. Note the gender of the crew. Uh, the guys were up here, so the women were building their houses. This is with an Ita Mexicana machine. This is Delan, my favorite project. I've been to Delan 15 times since 2009, and this was the school when we got there. There's about 400 kids that go to this school. That's the school. <laughs> That's it. And these are the children that go to that school. They're, they're adorable. They're wonderful. And this picture is of significance because the second, the second building, there, we're standing in front of the first building there. We had just started the second building, and we were doing some training, some classes. We were trying to get the community involved in our system. We did three Saturdays in a row. The first Saturday, we had 17 people. It was kind of disappointing. This is the third Saturday, which is two weeks later. We had 50 people. So the community came out in force and became involved. And from that group, we developed a team of Masons that I would take Anywhere, anywhere. These guys are fabulous. And this is them at work. I call it Masonry Orchestra because they're, they got it. They got it all figured out. The walls are plumb. The walls are straight. The blocks are great. And this is the Etal Mexicana system with the vertical rebar, horizontal rebar, and the U-blocks and what have you. Then they built, uh, Tom and I uh, just returned last week from this building, and I had no supervision on this building. Um, we, they made the blocks and built the walls themselves. We went to just help them uh, figure out the roof framing. And it was perfect, perfectly plumb, perfectly straight, and on their own. I feel real successful about what we've left there and what they can do. This is that same project. That's the school complex there. This is the first building with Orem blocks, the second building with uh, the Ital Mexicana, and the third building is also Ital blocks and 
and is nearly nearly complete. Enchilada, we're back in Texas now. Here we are in welfare, called the whole enchilada because Maria came to one of our workshops in San Antonio, drank the Kool-Aid, and said, I want it all. So she has earthen walls, earthen roof, earthen floor, earthen plaster, composting toilet, rainwater catchment, gray water recycling, the whole thing, you know. It's great. It's great when you get a client like that that walks the talk. This is that same house uh, nearing near completion. This is the current project in Fredericksburg. Earthen walls, earthen roof, earthen floor, earthen plaster, rainwater catchment, and what have you. My crew is sitting over here at the table. Uh, they've, they've done this, and they're, they're great. And it's a wonderful, wonderful project and a, and a wonderful client. Water catchment from a barrel roof is real easy. You know, you just make the valleys run one direction, and you can get it all. Uh, real simple. Same building again from the other side. You see these arches out in front. These are fired bricks, and I have a maestro coming up from Mexico next month. He's going to finish the bovidas. That's a porch roof. Uh, this is how those barrel vaults look from the inside, and that's again these. We made these little skinny six by twelves, and then we set them up on edge like that. And Tom has created with a SketchUp Home of the Future. We're 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 kind of backing away from the tiny house thing, and we're calling it the cozy house thing because. <laughs> Uh, we're not going to do the 200 uh, square footer, but this, this footprint is 800 square feet. It's 20 by 40. And again, with the big uh, barrel vault, you have lofts, so you have a lot more floor space within that small footprint. And this is an interior shot of that same thing. This is going to be Tom's house. We've, we're closing on six and a half acres in Stonewall, and we're going to walk the talk, and this one will be, will be out there. That's the six and a half acres. Uh, it's called the Texas Eco Village right now. I'm calling it the Texas Land Cooperative, TLC. There's nothing there right now except two seasonal streams and some oak trees. But we intend to regenerate this piece into a food forest that does everything for us. We're going to grow our own food. We're going to catch our own water. We're going to put sawdust on our poop. And <laughs> we're going to do it right. So... Uh, come be involved at some point if you like. Uh, this is going uh, to happen. So what if we change the way we build? Questions? Yeah.